there are many stories of success, many stories of uh, people having a hard time and working through to innovate and get through COVID-19. And our next guest this morning is one of those success stories. Carol Chen has started some six businesses over the course of her career and has found herself, like many companies, having to innovate and really move forward to make sure that her company would be able to survive. Many of you uh, listeners may know her, of course, from her work with the company Covatella, uh, which was uh, renting and selling high-end dresses uh, throughout the community here. And then she moved on to Mascala uh, during COVID-19, making masks. And now she is launching her own new eponymous label, Carol Chen. Welcome to Weekend Morning. So great to have you on. Thank you so much, Glenn. Happy to be here. Yeah, great to, great to get you on. And we've, we've talked so much over the years, and uh, one of the the things that I, I think is so amazing is you never stop. You keep going no matter what. No matter what's put in front of you, you either go through it, around it, over it, or underneath it. Uh, tell us what this past year has been like for you. Uh, well, like most people, it's been quite a challenge. Of course, Cavatella is very heavily event-focused. So once COVID happened, our business was pretty much obsolete. And with no fancy events, there's no need for fancy dresses. Yeah. Uh, so I had to actually figure out a way to pivot quite quickly, which is how we transitioned into making fancy masks with Mascala. Yeah, and the process of doing that, I know you, were, you, you had to eventually... Um, I believe you're taking some of t- taking some of the dresses were you, from from Covatella, and then d- how was that working with Mascella? Yeah, definitely. So it was actually quite a funny story because I was wearing surgical masks back in April when, quite frankly, a lot of people weren't even taking this seriously, and masks mm-hmm. weren't required. And, you know, I would get a lot of comments, even like, you know, going out to grocery stores or other places, like, why are you wearing a mask? You look scary. You should take it off because nobody else is wearing one. (laughs) And, you know, I just felt like, why do I have to be embarrassed uh, about protecting myself and others? So literally after one of these instances, I went back to my showroom and I decided to cut up one of my evening gowns at Covatella (laughs) and, and make like a sequin mask. That was like super shiny and fancy. And I said, no one's going to think I look scary like this. So, um, and actually it worked, you know, I posted it on my social media and just to get some responses and people thought I looked fabulous and nobody said I look scary again. So I just kind of ran with it. Um, and actually that was only a couple of days before circuit breaker happened. So mm-hmm. I literally like brought like a ton of dresses back to my apartment and I was like buying up all these fabrics in like the four days and I literally launched Mascala out of my bedroom just cutting up all my dresses because they weren't being used anyway and like all the fabric stores were closed by then so it's not like I could actually get fabric so I I was literally using dresses and it was doing so well that I actually had to cut up dresses that I didn't even really want to cut up (laughs) but you know um, it was it was helping me to survive more than Covatella was at the time. And, talk, about, uh, talk about upcycling, huh? I mean, that's, that's really, wow. <laughs> Taking yeah, uh, expensive I mean, dresses and, and cutting them up for masks. Right. But it's funny because, you know, I mean, you know, secondhand resale is great. Um, but the value you can get for a dress is not that much. But then, you know, having a unique product and something that's differentiated in the market is, is very valuable. We were one of the first ones to do designer masks. So, yeah, yeah it was, it's been like crazy like within like the first month we were already shipping like hundreds around the like world to like different countries we've already shipped to like i think 15 different countries and when i actually look yesterday at the list of countries that have gone to our website i think it's like over like 90 countries have been browsing and i'm like how did people like zimbabwe find us that's so crazy um but it's been an incredible ride like i never would have thought that quite frankly, like this business would do better than my last business. So. It's interesting because I know that initially you just sort of started this as something to do while you were sitting around. I might be slightly over exaggerating that, but, <laughs> but has, has it really become a, a viable business in and of itself? 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the advantages of, of having an e-commerce business is that you can ship worldwide. Your market is so much bigger and you're able to scale faster. With Covetella, um, you know, we had extreme amount of difficulty being able to ship uh, to other countries and then return the dresses back to us, right? I mean, we I think mm-hmm. we probably shipped to like 10 countries over the fa- five years, but like, you know, someone shipping to Cape Town would get slapped with like $160 worth of duties and it doesn't even make renting a dress worth it anymore. And then like it would get stuck in Jakarta and not being through customs and it was just like a mess. So like Covetella, even though it was an amazing business, super fun, we couldn't really figure out how to scale outside of Singapore. And so it kind of became this like very local business, which is great, you know, and like because we had been very established and we dressed the stars of Crazy Rich Asians, which was amazing. um, You know, we kind of became like a staple here for for designer rentals. But Mascala is just like another level because already out of the gate, people were able to find us around the world. Um, Of course, a lot of my friends in the U.S. were very supportive and helped spread the word. So it just ramped up really quickly. And, you know, I think it really shows you like you really have to listen to what the market demand is. You know, after starting a lot of businesses, I've always kind of done them out of necessity, really. Like, you know, okay, I started off as a designer and as a young designer, you know, you kind of think, oh, I just want to design things that are pretty and that I would wear. And and you don't really think if there's really a market for it. So for young Mm. entrepreneurs, I always tell them, like, you know, make sure that there's a demand for the product that you want to create because otherwise it's just a hobby if you're not making any money. Yeah, we're speaking with Carol Chen, fashion entrepreneur, and and Carol, as you mentioned, you've done this you've done this a number of times now. It's not your first rodeo in terms of starting a business. Uh, so the, the 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 element of timing uh, to me always seems to be one that entrepreneurs uh, hit famously well or miss spectacularly badly. And it seems like in this particular case, you've really hit it well with uh, with Mascella, especially. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, like I said, I think we were we had the advantage of being one of the first ones and um, being able to pivot so quickly. But also because of my design background, I feel like you know I've had an advantage of being able to have an eye for different fabrics. Um, but I was also very meticulous about how our masks were made. I knew it would be a very saturated market, so I decided yeah. to position ourselves as more premium. Because anyone can sell a $10, $20 mask, but we've literally had customers buying our masks for up to $300, which is insane. Is that right? Wow. Yeah, it's crazy. And like some of our masks are like 100 (laughs) to 300 and they've been, and, and, you know, I kind of did it like, well, one, they're hand sewn. So if I'm going to spend like hours and hours of my time hand sewing a mask, like I'm not going to sell it for 20 bucks. (laughs) So like, you know, they're very special. They're one of a kind, you know. Um, no two pieces look the same. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's for people who really want something unique and special. And of course they make great gifts. Uh, Mm. we've also added like mask chain, uh, mask chains and other things like that. So people, I mean, I I think people would be surprised like how much, um, you'd actually spend on something you wear every day. And I, for me, I tell people masks are like shoes, right? Mm. You, you have shoes for different occasions. If you're going running, don't wear a mascara mask. You probably can wear one of these Under Armour masks. But if you're going out to a nice dinner with friends, you want to dress up, that's when you put like a fancy designer mask on. Yeah, it brings brings new uh, thought to the the phrase "foot in mouth," doesn't it? Uh, if you're wearing a mask and like shoes, anyway, that's a whole other story. Uh, hey, we have a uh, we have a a, a a viewer on Facebook Live. I, it looks like he's probably from Chicago. I'm guessing. Can someone introduce me to Carol? She's my secret crush. Uh, I guess you probably know who that is, uh, Joe joining us uh, from the U.S. Hi, Joe. Nice to have you on with us today. <laughs> um, Carol, you know, with with the, the pleasure of Mascala also came, you know, a certain amount of pain of having to close down um, uh, Covatella, which was really your baby for years now. And you worked so hard to get that up and going. You had a, a beautiful studio and, you know, lots and lots, hundreds of dresses and all of that. Tell us about the... The, the process you had to go through of winding down a business that was, was so close to you, uh, because many people, uh, probably even some listening today, have either had to go through that experience or maybe in that experience right now. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it definitely helped that I've had to close multiple businesses in the past. I had a fashion brand in LA that essentially went bankrupt. Uh, I had an MMA brand in Hong Kong that didn't work out. And so, you know, I've been through it, but it's never hard. It's like breaking up with a boyfriend. You know, it's like, it's, it's never really? easy <laughs> <laughs> unless it gets really bad, right? Yeah, and, right? you know, Kavitella was one of those things where it's just like, it's not a great relationship and it's not like being that helpful anymore. But, you know, you still have a lot of memories there. So it's still hard to let go sometimes. Uh, so I'm not going to lie. I, I definitely struggled with it. Although I feel like a lot of people on the outside felt like it just seemed very seamless. I just jumped from one business to another, but I mean, looking back, I probably should have just shut it down in, in March, you know, when, when I saw that people were canceling all of their events and like, this was becoming a thing. Uh, but I held on to it, you know, hoping, and obviously the government helped uh, with some re relief programs. But I kept holding on to it, I kept re renegotiating my rent with my landlord to see how we could just like keep going and then come mm. back over, you know, after the pandemic was over. But I think then it got to the point where it's like, we don't know when this is going to end, right? We don't know when yeah. events are going to come back. And I mean, hind there's a hindsight lot of is always 2020, isn't it? You know, you can always look back yeah. and say, but at that point in time, nobody knew how long this was really going to go on for. And, and then, honestly, we still don't, do we? Right, exactly. So, and, you know, because I had, and, you know, back to the boyfriend analogy, I'm sorry, but like, once you find somebody better, then it's really easy to let go, right? <laughs> and that's what Mascella was for me, right? Mascella was like, you know, this better version of business that was a lot, you know, a lot more advantageous. And so at that point, once it got to the point where, you know, it was making more money than Cavatella frankly ever did then you know i it was it was easier to let go yeah, that was that easy point, yeah you know? But, you know in terms of closing a business is it sort of the band-aid analogy just rip rip the band-aid off as fast as you can and get it done or do different businesses need a certain level of of care and consideration when you think about closing them down uh, as, as you have done this a couple of times now right so i think that's a big reason why i never took on investors because i think it depends on the nature of your business and how complex your shareholding is right and mm. if you have a lot of other parties involved then it does become like this prolonged process and it's not just about you you have to consider yep. everyone who's involved business partners investors etc so even though early on like we did get term sheets and like um offers for investment, uh, there was always a part of me that said, you know, until I really, really need it, like I'm going to scale to the U.S. or something like that, then I really want to be in full control of the future and be able to make decisions quickly as like this year, I mean, it happened like that, right? Had, yeah. had I had a lot of other parties involved, I think it would have been even a like more drawn out process. But because it was just me, I own 100% of the company, I can shut it down next week, no one can say anything. And I, right. I literally just did, you know, after once I made the decision, okay, I'm going to do this. And I told my interns, okay, we have to get rid of everything in the store in two weeks. Wow. And we just had like these massive, you know, fire sales and sold off our inventory. And actually, you know, because our dresses are timeless, they actually went for, you know, a good price. So I, I didn't feel like I was actually losing that much. It was, we, we were able to sell off our inventory for, for quite a bit. Yeah. And then, um, you know, all of our furniture was still in good condition. So the liquidation process went better than I expected. And fortunately I had a good team of interns to help me juggle that because also at the time of trying to close down Cavatella, like Mascella was like really ramping up. And then I was doing this de design competition. So I was literally juggling three businesses at the same time, which is crazy. But Carol, that's <laughs> usually, that's usually, you're usually doing at least three things. In fact, I was going to say that's probably a, a fewer number of things than you normally are juggling at any point in time. So I wouldn't have <laughs> thought that'd be too much trouble for you. But but let's, that's a good segue to uh, the uh, the winner uh, of the Singapore Fashion Award 2020. Um, it, it was, uh, it was a, a big uh, event here in Singapore. Tell us about the competition, uh, the Singapore Stories Design Competition, I believe it was called. Tell us about that. Yeah, so actually, you know, I had been hired to produce the show originally. 
because uh, I produce fashion shows on the side. And, you know, so I did like a site recce. But then once I realized uh, what the prize package was, you get to be <laughs> featured at the Asian Civilization Museum. You get to go to Paris Fashion Week representing Singapore. You know, all of these amazing things. I was like, wow, like that's so awesome. That You're like, organize it yourself. I'm joining the competition. <laughs> <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> <laughs> basically what happened but it was really good because i think you know there's always been a part of me I, i've been wanting to be a fashion designer ever since i was a little girl i was started like making dresses out of you know like newspapers and blankets since i was like five years old and and so and then i eventually got my fashion design degree and i think a lot of people in singapore don't know that i was trained as a fashion designer and that that was like my life you know um over here, I'm more as just like a businesswoman, entrepreneur. Mm. But, you know, back in the U.S., I, I was a designer. So I always kind of wanted to go back to that eventually. But I just felt like the timing was never right. And, you know, part of it is mm. scary. You know, la launching your own brand, especially one that's tied to your own name, of course. Uh, is, yeah. is quite hard. You know, because especially when you name it after yourself, you're like, wow, this is such a representation of who I am. And it just adds so much pressure that I almost you can't mess it up, right? You can't yeah, you mess can't. it up. <laughs> exactly. So I'm like, oh my God. So I kept pushing it off. But once this competition came around, I was like, and then obviously COVID was happening. I wasn't sure what, how Mascala was doing. Covatello was on the decline. So I was like, why not? You know, better time than ever. I don't really have that much to do. So I thought, um, so let me just give this a shot, right? And this is the perfect time to maybe like chase this pipe dream of launching Carol Chen and see what happens and, and use this as a launching pad. Um, so I did it and it was amazing because, you know, Taft put together all these great mentorship programs. So I had really amazing mentors, uh, like the publisher of Vogue and like the head of fashion at LaSalle and they were able to really instill confidence in me that I was like either like going in the right direction or I just trusted my gut because I had been out of design for almost a decade that I felt very rusty and I was up against all these other amazing designers that had established brands and very well known in Singapore so it was, it was pretty intimidating yeah. um, but you know I just so you had to design a couple of pieces to to put into the competition. Is that how it worked, or what, what was yeah, the so, actual thing? Yeah. So so there's an application process, and to make it to top ten, uh, you had to design one piece and a, a oh. portfolio and like a sketch concept. So then from there, once you made a top ten finalist, um, you you know uh, they pick the top ten from that one piece, and then the top five was selected from there, and then you had to make a five piece capsule collection. Oh. So, and you had a couple months to do that. And that's when you got like more oh. mentorship and, and, you know, it was literally like a mini project runway. It was quite fun, but very stressful at the same time. Yeah. What, what kind of uh, style will, will the clothes be that, that you're going to do? Is it only men, uh, women's fashion, men's fashion? How, how's it, what's it going to look like when you, when you actually launch uh, the lines? Um, well, I like to do women's wear because, yeah. you know, I like to sure. wear things that I can wear. <laughs> yeah. But it was really interesting because the, the theme was Singapore stories for the competition. And what I thought was fascinating was that each, all five of us picked a different era of Singapore mm. to focus on. You know, some of them picked, um, like her grandparents migrated to Singapore as like one of the early immigrants and she focused on that. Another one was about like um, you know the the uprising of Singapore and how it rose to power, and, and then you know I focus on the future of Singapore and like present day because I actually live Marina Bay. I overlook Marina Bay Sands and Gardens mm. by the Bay, and I go to Jewel all the time. And so I'm really inspired by the modern architecture here, mm. all the, the juxtaposition of nature and technology that you see, and like its emphasis on sustainability. So yeah. I really crafted my collection based on these themes. And so I used like pretty innovative fabrics that looked like, like laser cut. I also 3D printed some of my own accessories. Mm. Uh, I used very unconventional fabrics to kind of like mimic the, um, like the crystal clouds made of metal. Um, and then I upcycled fabric. So I actually literally took one of my Indian dresses that I had designed for this wedding 
Um, and I cut it all up. And my friend said I was crazy because I had spent, I don't know, probably $4,000 on this Indian gown. <laughs> and I was just like literally taking scissors to it, just like chopping it up into pieces so I could re- upcycle the fabric. And, you know, from that one dress, I was able to like use the fabric across like five different pieces. Mm. And, you know, it turned out amazing. And um, wow. I, I was really happy with it. So what's next now for Carol Chen, the brand, uh, the clothing brand? So we will have the opportunity to show at Paris Fashion Week next October. So for that, I'll be designing a, a full collection of more pieces in order to like fully launch. Um, and in the meantime, I'll probably also still focus on Mascella because, again, you know, I am an entrepreneur first and foremost. And... Um, you know, you need money to eat, and, like, that's what's paying the bills right now. So yeah, sure. while the pandemic is happening, um, and it's really, you know, I, I get emails almost every day of customers saying how, you know, how grateful they are that we have created beautiful masks to help them mm. with this time. You know, they say, you know, COVID is a terrible time, but because of your beautiful masks, it makes it so much easier, and I still am able to feel stylish and beautiful when I go out, even though I have to cover half my face. Yeah. And so I, you know, I love hearing stories like that because it is a really hard time for everybody, and just you know, adding that special sparkle and like being able to like make it a little bit more lighthearted situation is is really great. And so that, that's very this, much what that's very much what you heard though when you had you know, Covatella as well, right? I mean, there's really this idea of you know women that wanted to go out to a special event, a special evening occasion, and you really you really enjoyed helping them to feel good about doing that, as I recall from years gone by. Yeah, absolutely. Because when I first came here, I realized everything's so expensive here, especially when it comes to designer clothes. Mm. And it didn't seem right that like unless you spend a thousand dollars on a dress, you can't look beautiful right yeah. and so we really did create this like complete styling destination because a lot of women also don't know how to piece things together so we offer like shoes jewelry bags the whole cinderella experience to help them look beautiful and you know now that events are gone we try to like you know transition that energy into like just you know making them feel beautiful with our masks so you go from that to cutting up four thousand dollar dresses. Uh, <laughs> interesting. You really are on a journey, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whatever it takes. I'll Whatever it. it takes. Exactly. That could be your new motto. I think. Whatever it takes. <laughs> Carol Chen, uh, thank you so much for uh, being with us today on the show. From Covatella to Mascella to now Carol Chen, the brand. Uh, congratulations on the latest endeavor. I hope it goes well for you. Thank you so much, Glenn. It's been a pleasure.